Hello. You better not cry. You better not shout. Hi. It's Gary Lucas here. And it's Boxing Day and the day after Christmas. It's when you put everything that you absolutely hated that people gave you as a gift back into the box and then go try and flog it somewhere. If, if someone will take it, I don't know. But uh, luckily I only got good stuff for Christmas so far. And Hanukkah. So I'm not complaining. And anyway, what is it? It's December 26th. And uh, it's a beautiful day here in New York. It's really sunny and nice, and it's about time. And hold on just a second. I think I left the kettle boiling. Oh, dead air. Make sure we're not setting fire to anything. Okay. All right, I'm back. We'll soon to be back. Anyway, 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 no. Always good to check these things out. Always good to check these things out. I've, I've ruined many a teapot by uh, forgetting that the thing was on the burner. And then, you know, if it doesn't whistle, you're out of luck. So I'm going to play some more Nino Rota music to start off things today. Nino Rota being my favorite composer of film music, pretty much. Uh, I'd rate him certainly in the top three. But usually number one, pole position, especially when I've seen a bunch of Fellini films, who is absolutely my favorite director. I've had uh, the pleasure of visiting the Fellini Museum in Rimini, over there on the uh, east coast of Italy. They have a wonderful museum devoted to his films. And in fact, I met Terry Gilliam, who was giving a lecture there, the Monty Python uh, former animator for Monty Python, and later uh, esteemed director in his own right of many a good film, including Brazil, oh, and uh, the fabulous Baron Mulhausen. Speaking of which, uh, if you like animation, there is a superb set out there now that's come out, and uh, it takes three of the best of Carol Zeman's films. I don't know if you know that name. My Czech fans would of course, because they have a Zeman Museum right off the Charles Bridge. But he is one of the great pioneering animators, and his films are delightful. They look like 19th century, 18th century woodcuts come to life, integrated with live action. And he did a fantastic, fabulous Baron Munchausen, which is certainly worth seeing, and that's part of this set, which also apparently pops up when you open the DVDs. They're little uh, pop-up cardboard tableau from the films on each box. This is, I have to see it, but more importantly, I want to get this. I want to get my hands on it. Anyway, all the more reason you got to support independent music, folks, because, <laughs> you know, uh, I love to, like, turn you on to stuff, but uh, not everybody is going to provide these things cheaply or for nothing to me. And I tried really hard to get a hold of this new Fellini Blu-ray box, Oh, very allergic to life these days, and uh, it's it was a no-go. They said we have too many people who are going to write about it, so uh, I have to save my pennies for that one. But there is a new box that's come out with eight of the best of Fellini's films on Blu-ray, and including many, many lost uh, artifacts, let's say clips, documentaries about Fellini, about each film, and it goes into death, blah, blah. Always good. Very time-consuming to wade through that all. But, you know, and I began collecting books and later music and then later on uh, DVDs. I always thought, well, I'm going to put this away for my old age. But here I am already in a, in a ripe old age. Well, I want to say exactly. I mean, I feel very young at heart. Let's put it that way. And I'm in relatively good shape medically and otherwise, thank God. But, uh, you know, now is the time, especially under lockdown, but then, of course, one feels guilty, like, I should be out there creating new work. And uh, I am. I am all the time. I, I've never stopped. And I have a whole bunch of albums scheduled to come out next year. We'll see. 
First and foremost among them, I'm doing a lot of advertisements for myself now. The Essential Gary Lucas, this thing I've kept under wraps for months now. It's all sealed and good to go. Now this one is open. Sumptuous package, double CD, and it covers 40 years of my, of my music. And I hope you like it, because there's something for everybody on there, folks. And if you don't like one thing, I'm sure the next selection that comes up is something that you will like. I don't know. I was told to have a consistent sound, that that would be my ticket to commercial success. Many years ago, by, by mandarins in the music biz, but uh, I continued to do <laughs> whatever the fuck I felt like, and kept on my merry old way here, and I'm still here, so there. Anyway, I'm going to start with the first song that I ever played in a live setting solo here in New York, and it is Nino Rota's theme from Fellini's Casanova.
it's, it's kind of a horse latitudes moment, <laughs> isn't it? Well, uh, yes, that started when Lena wrote uh, music from Fellini's Casanova, starring Donald Sutherland, a very curious film, one of my favorites. Actually, I recommend it. I guess that's available now. To, for a while, it was only available from the British Film Institute on DVD. But we, there's an, it's probably in this new box, actually. Uh, certainly worth checking out. I saw it when I moved to New York permanently in 1977 at the, uh, the Bleecker Street Cinema. Now, that was an oasis of a great film exhibition in New York, as was the Waverly Theater. Uh, anyway, Bleecker Street Cinema is long gone. Waverly continued on up until closing for the pandemic. And uh, I, I, like everybody, I, I hope this is a short-lived affair. But uh, you notice that when I did start doing these pandemic concerts, the subtitle was always A Journal of the Plague Years. Now, if you know the original by Defoe, it's A Journal of the Plague Year. Something told me this thing was not going to to be over so quickly. I mean, although I pray that it it certainly is, and that everybody gets vaccinated, and yeah, uh, but it's it's been <laughs> a long, strange trip, has it not? But in the meantime, with whatever disposable income you might have, you might want to investigate a couple of great books. I'm on a Malaparte kick. This is Curzio Malaparte, great Italian writer. This is his book, The Skin. Uh, which I just started, and uh, like a lot of my reading habits, I dip into these things, and I rotate about five or six books at a time. I take them on and off the turntable of my consciousness and apply myself to reading them until, I don't know, I, I can't really keep my eyes open, which usually occurs at about 3 a.m. during this, uh, this strange period of time. But uh, everything I've read, I've read three of his books this year. I, I mentioned Kaput, which is probably the best known. That's a classic. But New York Review of Books also issued The Kremlin Ball, which is savage and, and funny. And uh, I mean, Malaparte was there and knew a lot of people uh, historically. Specifically, his heyday was 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And he was a renegade writer, and also an artist, and, and apparently made some films too, I haven't seen them. And an architect, he designed this fantastic house in Capri, which is used throughout the setting of Jean-Luc Godard's Le Mépris film, here in this country known as Contempt. Uh, the house where the action takes place is a house designed by Malaparte, it's one of the great modernist marvels of architecture in the world. And uh, his writing is superb. A lot of it is sort of, I would say, semi-fictionalized reportage. Uh, he probably took some liberties. And you never do know when he's stretching the truth or really inventing stuff up whole cloth. But his take on what's going on around him during especially the war years, where he at the end switched sides and was greeted actually with, with enthusiasm by the Allies when he saw what was going down under Mussolini, who he had a falling out with early, early on. In fact, he wrote a book called Coup d'etat, A Technique, or The Technique of Coup d'etat, which landed him a jail sentence for a while. I don't think he served all that long, but he was put away for a bit to dare challenge, or even advance the notion that there might be something less than permanent about fascism in Italy. And uh, the title was actually taken up by the historian and writer Edward Lutbach, who has a book also called Coup d'etat, which comes at the subject from another angle. And the fact we're kind of witnessing, although I, don't, I think it's a foregone conclusion at this point, Trump's attempt to, to pull a coup d'etat in slow motion in plain sight of everybody. But people are wise to his games, and I think right now it's sputtering to a close for mere attention-getting status, you know, to keep his name in the conversation. He's a guy who cannot 
stand to be not talked about or written about or photographed. He's addicted to this, I and mean, that's partly why he's in the game in the first place. I don't think it was specifically to govern that he had any notion of what that meant uh, when he got involved, but uh, you know, it seemed like a reasonable thing. Let's see what happens, so this is what happened. And we're suffering with consequences, but not for long, thank God. Not for much longer, so... Okay, well, I still have your attention. I hope I still have your attention. Let's do something in this... Uh, this is drop D, the key of drop D, where the low E string tunes down one step to D. Instrumental that became a song called She Is Free that I wrote with Jeff Buckley. And while you're at it, check out for the holidays Mary Sears' great book, Jeff Buckley, uh, in his own uh, words. And uh, also, The Estate came out with a book all about grace. This one is Mary's over there standing at 20 years of grace. And the estate is Jeff Buckley in his own words. And they're both excellent uh, additions to 
anyone's library, if you're interested in the story of one of the greatest musicians who ever walked the planet, in my estimation, and I've worked with a few. And uh, what else do I got? Oh, yeah. I've been meaning to read this book. Uh, it's called Nightmare Alley. There's a great film that was made of this, kind of a film noir with John Garfield. It's by William Lindsay Gresham. And it's got an introduction by my friend, Nick Toshis, my late friend who passed away. Tragically, uh, oh, well, he missed the pandemic, lucky guy. But uh, he was a great writer and a character and uh, shook things up in a big way. So uh, I'm really looking forward to diving into that. And what else can I tell you? What else? What else here? Uh, oh, yeah. She is free. You know, it's Sun Glory is on this great album, which came out about a year and a half ago, called The Complete Jeff Buckley and Gary Lucas Songbook, which features Davide Combusti, the Nero, on vocals, and production by my friend Francesco Arpino, who's a great producer, multi-instrumentalist, and a uh, shout out to the late, great Pierre Ruiz, who had the vision to record this album and was very instrumental uh, in a hands-on kind of way of the sessions. And uh, he passed away in a mountain climbing accident in Sardinia, also a tragedy this year. But yeah, I really miss this guy, he had a great spirit. And, and Nero and Francesco and I went on a tour thanks to Luca Zanotti. I want to give a special thanks about a year ago in this period. Actually, I think I came home on New Year's Eve, but we worked, we had a Christmas off in Rome, and then did some more shows uh, all over. I mean, every day was about a 10-hour drive in a different direction. It was one of those, take every gig that comes in, you know, like we need it. So uh, I don't mind it, though, because I'm kind of a road warrior. After all these years, I like it. I like it just fine, and uh, the <laughs> tour, where's the next tour? I'm ready for the next tour. To quote my friend James Blood Almer, at the end of an exhausting Knitting Factory based tour in 91, that I went on 20 shows in 21 days on six different countries, hip hopping, hopscotching, all over the checkerboard of Europe, on planes, trains, buses, <laughs> Got some good stories about that one, which I'll save for another time. But at the end of the tour, everybody was completely knocked out except for Blood, because Blood insisted on staying in a separate hotel from everybody else and had to be a four star. She says, I understand it at this age, I would do the same. And uh, he traveled by himself too, he didn't want to associate with the Hoi Polloi, such as the the 15 or so other musicians that comprised the Knitting Factory Tours Europe in 91. But when we all met up at the airport, everybody was exhausted except for blood. We kind of bemusedly looked at everybody and said, Tua, I am ready to go on the next tour. When is the next tour going to start? So with that in mind, I ask you that same question. I'm raring to go. I can't wait to get out there and play for you live again. Somebody get me a vaccine, quick. And uh, until next time, which is Tuesday, have a wonderful weekend. I really always enjoy having you here and inviting you to my home to play. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. We're coming on New Year's. Thanks a lot, everybody, for tuning in. Love you. See you soon.